Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we have a rather important video for you all, especially if you are a citizen or resident of the United States of America. A few days ago, the Supreme Court of the United States issued a set to opinions related to an issue of supreme national importance. That issue, of course, being whether or not the federal government acting through its agencies and secretaries could mandate that specific individuals get vaccinated in order to retain their jobs. Now, that's a simplification of some of what's going on here. We're going to read through these opinions in order to discuss why I labeled this video, how not to write them. Because one of the most fundamental issues in the law, and this is outside of the United States, this is every jurisdiction that has a legal system of any kind, one of the most fundamental issues is allowing people to understand how the decisions came to be, how the law applies to specific circumstances. And unfortunately, to every op-ed writer and every journalist out there that looks at these two opinions and says, well, those are clearly just backfilled by a Supreme Court that's deciding on the fly what's okay and what's not. I have a lot of difficulty disagreeing with that assessment because of the way their specific arguments are made in these documents. But in order to talk about that, we have to go into the reasoning that the Supreme Court puts forth in these documents. And I think it's important for everybody, really, that's living in the United States to understand what the Supreme Court just said about these mandates. Now, a couple of things before we start. One, it is important to note that there are actually two opinions here. The first relates to OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. That's the big one that relates to all employers, realistically, that have more than 100 employees in the United States. But there is a second opinion, which really creates some of the fog here with how these opinions were issued by the Supreme Court, that relates to the Department of Health and Human Services, and more specifically, programs that are funded by Medicare and Medicaid that are requiring their employees to be vaccinated and that the Secretary of Health and Human Services ordered that separately from the OSHA order. These two decisions were made simultaneously. They were issued by the Supreme Court simultaneously. And unfortunately, they go in opposite directions in a manner that really confuses what the legal basis for the issue is here in a way that I think is really, really problematic for both the Supreme Court and folks that try to understand the law and how these individuals, these justices, are coming up with their decisions. The second thing that we should take into account before we start reading through the specifics of these opinion documents is that these are not actually opinions as we usually think about them from the Supreme Court. This is not after a merits hearing. This is not the Supreme Court deciding that one side is right or wrong. This is instead and you'll be familiar with this if you followed all of Epic versus Apple, for example, here in virtual legality, this is instead kind of the preliminary injunction phase. What the Supreme Court is being faced with is various states and various circuit courts of appeals at the federal level deciding to stop or not stop some of these orders and the Supreme Court deciding whether to allow those injunctions, stay those injunctions, and otherwise before actually addressing the merits of the case. Now, some of that is important. Some of that is not. As we know here in virtual legality, one of the most important things for a court to assess at even that preliminary stage is whether or not the court thinks that one side or the other will ultimately win, which is how I think most people read these opinion documents is that the court thinks that OSHA will lose and that the Secretary of Health and Safety will instead win their particular case. And in case you want to have kind of the Cliff Notes version of these documents before we get into it, you can understand that the Supreme Court blocked the federal government's COVID vaccine or test requirement for large workplaces, that's the OSHA case, but allowed the vaccine mandate for workers at federally funded healthcare facilities, that's the second case. So we've got a block and a non-block, and how those come together is really where I think the Supreme Court made a significant error. So let's read first the OSHA decision. We'll read a little bit of the dissent in both of these cases so that you can have an understanding of what happened here. And that's first and foremost out of all of this. I'll editorialize a little bit about how I think it's written poorly, how they could have gone in a different direction even to arrive at the same outcome. But what's most important to my viewers, to my listeners, in my opinion, is for them to understand what happened here first and foremost. So hopefully I can help with that at the outset. 
First of all, this is a per curiam opinion. That means that the whole court is writing this, even though that's not really the case. You'll see dissents here. We're able to figure out that this is effectively a 6-3 decision and the other decision is effectively a 5-4 decision. The per curiam opinion in the OSHA case goes as follows. The Secretary of Labor, acting through the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, recently enacted a vaccine mandate for much of the nation's workforce. The mandate, which employers must enforce, applies to roughly 84 million workers, covering virtually all employers with at least 100 employees. It requires that covered workers receive a COVID-19 vaccine, and it preempts contrary state laws. The only exception is for workers who obtain a medical test each week at their own expense and on their own time, and also wear a mask each workday. OSHA has never before imposed such a mandate, nor has Congress. I highlight that in red because that will be of significance to the court in making this determination that OSHA does not have this power. Congress enacted the Occupational Safety and Health Act in 1970. The act created the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, which is part of the Department of Labor and under the supervision of its secretary. Stepping back just a step here, both of these decisions relate to whether or not the executive branch of the United States can undertake these specific tasks. We have any number of lawsuits and decisions and opinions and court filings and rulings and everything else over the last two years about whether states can do something, whether cities can do something, whether health administrations in those states or cities can do something. This is different. This is about the U.S. federal government sitting above the states in the U.S. doing something not through a congressional action, or at least not through a separate one, and that'll be a point of contention between the two sides in these various cases, that Congress didn't do something special to get these vaccine mandates. Instead, what you've got is a speech from President Biden. You've got some tweets which are ill-advised about workarounds for congressional authority, and an executive agency here, OSHA, doing something essentially unilaterally on an emergency basis and whether or not that should be allowed. Now, you might think that that's a constitutional question, and I would tend to agree with you. In all honesty, these opinions basically allied most of the constitutional considerations of that, instead focusing specifically on whether the congressional statutes for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, for Medicare and Medicaid, give authority to these agencies, to these secretaries, to these departments to do what they purported to do. But it's important to understand, especially if you're not from around here, the United States, that there are three branches of government and the legislative is being accused of not acting here and executive doing too much with the judiciary, of course, acting as referee. As its name suggests, OSHA is tasked with ensuring occupational safety, that is safe and healthful working conditions. Such standards must be reasonably necessary or appropriate to provide safe or healthful employment. And they add emphasis to that word employment here. They must also be developed using a rigorous process that includes notice, comment, and an opportunity for a public hearing. The act contains an exception to those ordinary notice and comment procedures for emergency temporary standards. So there are a couple of things already happening here as the court introduces this issue. The first of which, as you can tell, the court is emphasizing that OSHA is only supposed to have authority over employment questions. And we will see it's important to the court that since COVID-19 isn't limited to anywhere in particular, and because OSHA just mandated things based on number of employees and not specifics related to contact or participation in close quarters or anything like that, that the court thinks that this is too broad because OSHA essentially is trying to assert a general health and welfare standard rather than something related specifically to employment. The dissent disagrees with that characterization, as you would expect them to do. Prior to the emergence of COVID-19, the secretary had used this power, the emergency power, just nine times before and never to issue a rule as broad as this one. Of those nine emergency rules, six were challenged in court, and only one of those was upheld in full. Now, none of that is actually terribly pertinent to the question before the court today, but it does establish a history of OSHA trying to use emergency measures, getting smacked down by this court, not the individuals that represent this court as of right now, but the court in general, and not actually getting their emergency rules through in most circumstances. On September 9th, 2021, President Biden announced a new plan to require more Americans to be vaccinated. After a two-month delay, the Secretary of Labor issued the promised emergency standard. 
The regulation operates as a blunt instrument. It draws no distinctions based on industry or risk of exposure to COVID-19. So here already you can see the court preparing to establish that the rule isn't narrowly tailored to what OSHA should be even trying to achieve with its employment regulatory authority and is proceeding with what the court characterizes very early on as a blunt instrument. The court then summarizes basically how it got this case and talks about some of the decisions that were made specifically here in the Sixth Circuit. Chief Judge Sutton dissented. He reasoned that the secretary's broad assertions of administrative power demand unmistakable legislative support, which he found lacking. And we're going to come back to this point time and time again as we look at these documents. This concept that if Congress is going to allow an executive agency to do something massive, like require 84 million people to get vaccinated, then the court is going to demand that Congress is very clear and specific about delegating that authority to the executive agency, sometimes called the major questions doctrine, is very pertinent to the constitutional structures of the United States. We will see Justice Gorsuch talk about this in the concurrence to this opinion a little bit. Uh, but primarily the focus is that Congress, which is the elected representatives of the people and the states, are supposed to be in charge of rulemaking. And if they don't act with specificity when they talk about giving the executive branch some power, that creates a constitutional problem and the court should step in. As you might imagine, that is not a doctrine with a lot of quantifiable borderlines. And one of the big issues with these two opinions is that the major questions doctrine appears to apply until it doesn't. And in both sets of opinions, you basically have a philosophical disagreement as to what powers the executive branch should be allowed to use. And it's not resolved because of the way these two opinions are written. We'll get to that a little bit more, but this is the first kind of flash talking about the major questions doctrine and the problems that's going to present in these two documents. Here, the court basically says we're going to find against OSHA. Applicants are likely to succeed on the merits of their claim that the secretary lacked the authority to impose the mandate. Administrative agencies are creatures of statute. They accordingly possess only authority that Congress has provided. We expect Congress to speak clearly when authorizing an agency to exercise powers of vast economic and political significance. And that quote will be used in both of these documents a lot. I don't believe I highlighted it every time. But if that rings a bell to you, and it should, it's a quote from a case that is very, very recent. It was actually the court striking down the eviction moratorium, saying that Congress didn't give this authority to the CDC, to these various folks, to actually do these kinds of things, to require evictions to be paused. And the court says, if Congress is going to do something like that, we expect them to speak plainly and to make it obvious that that was their intent. The question then, the court continues, is whether the act plainly authorizes the secretary's mandate. It does not. Now, the dissent protests that we are imposing a limit found no place in the governing statute, but... The Solicitor General does not dispute that OSHA is limited to regulating work-related dangers. She instead argues that the risk of contracting COVID-19 qualifies as just such a danger. We cannot agree. Although COVID-19 is a risk that occurs in many workplaces, it is not an occupational hazard in most. COVID-19 can and does spread at home, in schools, during sporting events, and everywhere else that people gather. That kind of universal risk is no different from the day-to-day -day dangers that all face from crime, air pollution, or any number of communicable diseases. Permitting OSHA to regulate the hazards of daily life simply because most Americans have jobs and face those same risks while on the clock would significantly expand OSHA's regulatory authority without clear congressional authorization. So the court here is sitting on that fact that they emphasized earlier that the kind of signal they would do that OSHA is in charge of employment places, not everywhere on earth, not everywhere in the United States. And if something is of general applicability, like COVID-19 is, that OSHA is the wrong agency to really be settling this. Now, if you think that OSHA is maybe the wrong agency or perhaps not the best and most narrowly tailored, but still could perform this important function, you likely read these paragraphs of the opinion as the court essentially abdicating its duty to keep Americans from dying. And I think you see that in some of the journalism and reporting on this particular decision. My issue is more specifically with the fact that this reasoning, if it is accurate, 
it's a little bit difficult to find how it doesn't apply to the other side of the equation, at least how the court wrote it. Now, the court also has problems with vaccinations in general. They say a vaccination cannot be undone at the end of the workday, but they also do want to point out that they aren't against everything OSHA could possibly do. The court says that is not to say OSHA lacks authority to regulate occupation specific risks related to COVID-19, where the virus poses a special danger because of the particular features of an employee's job or workplace. Targeted regulations are plainly permissible, but OSHA's indiscriminate approach fails to account for the crucial distinction between occupational risk and risk more generally. And accordingly, the mandate takes on the character of a general public health measure rather than an occupational safety or health standard. Now, if you are in favor of OSHA's mandate here or attempted mandate, as it turns out here at the Supreme Court level, one thing that you might take away from paragraphs like this one is that the court is primarily objecting to the tailoring of what OSHA did. And there can be no doubt that just all employers over 100 people is a fairly blunt instrument that OSHA decided to use based on the premise that it was an emergency. Uh, and had they been more narrowly tailored, had they gone through more of a process, perhaps they would have lost that emergency argument. And so you can see the thinking behind why they would do it so bluntly. Here, the Supreme Court basically says that bluntness is effectively fatal to what OSHA wants to do, but it does allow OSHA to go back to the drawing board and say, all right, well, then we'll aim this specifically at when you're close together and when you're actually interacting with COVID, when you're doing other things. And this could spin around with a new OSHA regulation in relatively short order, I would argue. It is telling that OSHA, in its half century of existence, has never before adopted a broad public health regulation of this kind, addressing a threat that is untethered in any causal sense from the workplace. This lack of historical precedent, coupled with the breadth of authority that the secretary now claims, is a telling indication that the mandate extends beyond the agency's legitimate reach. Now, this quote, I think, is fairly bad, but effectively the court is saying, hey, you've never done this before, and now that you're asking to do it, that's giving away the game and telling us that you don't have the right to do it. And I don't think that's a terribly good argument from the court here, but it is what they are relying upon before they head into Section B. The equities do not justify withholding interim relief. And here the court tries to address what we were talking about at that preliminary injunction level. Technically, when you're evaluating uh, this kind of preliminary decision, you're supposed to evaluate whether the one side will win, whether the public interest leans one way or the other, whether one side will be harmed if you don't stay these kinds of injunctions, et cetera, et cetera. The Supreme Court, such as it is, doesn't follow along with the way that this is ruled upon at the lower court levels where you go down the elements. Instead, they do things like say the equities do not justify withholding interim relief, just kind of combining a bunch of the requirements. It says, for its part, the federal government does say that the mandate will save over 6,500 lives and prevent hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations. Although Congress has indisputably given OSHA the power to regulate occupational dangers, it has not given that agency the power to regulate public health more broadly. Requiring the vaccination of 84 million Americans selected simply because they work for employers with more than 100 employees certainly falls in the latter category. Blunt instrument, the Congress didn't put this vaccination right in front of OSHA. OSHA should not be allowed to do it. That's all you actually get from the court's primary per curiam opinion, the one that a majority of the justices agreed upon. Now, you get more specifics when you get down into the concurrences here. And this is a lot more writing than is usual for a decision like this from the court. This is obviously very important to a lot of the justices, to the Supreme Court itself. So you get concurrences, you get dissents. And here, Justice Gorsuch writes, the central question we face today is who decides? No one doubts that the COVID-19 pandemic has posed challenges for every American or that our state, local, and national governments all have roles to play in combating the disease. The only question is whether an administrative agency in Washington, one charged with overseeing workplace safety, may mandate the vaccination or regular testing of 84 million people, or whether, as 27 states before us submit, that work belongs to state and local governments across the country and the people's elected representatives in Congress. So you have what amounts to a philosophical and constitutional debate, joined here by Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito. The dissent disagrees with basically all of this, but this is where these two opinions actually rest. And unfortunately, because of the way they are written, because of the way the opinions actually come out, there is no settlement of the things that Gorsuch says here or the things that the dissent and other parties say on the other side of the equation. But let's get what Gorsuch is saying about the constitutional structure. 
I start with this court's precedence. There is no question that state and local authorities possess considerable power to regulate public health. There really isn't any question. That's what we call the police power in the United States. The federal government's powers, however, are not general, but limited and divided. And that's an area where I think a lot of people, especially those that haven't gone to law school and read all these old cases, get a little bit confused in the United States. The constitutional structure of the U.S. government is not one where the government has all these powers and then you figure out what the people in the states get. No, the Constitution of the United States is written in opposite to that, that the federal government only gets the powers that are named to it and everything else is the states and the people's. That means that when the federal government and Congress tries to do something, generally speaking, in the law, they have to point to the place in the Constitution where they are allowed to do it. And that sets the U.S. apart from some other countries. It sets it apart from other understandings of government. I'm not going to sit here and tell you the United States is perfect with this kind of dual approach, but this is the way that it is set up. And it's one of the areas that people skip when they're looking at these particular opinions, which is this isn't the same as mandated vaccines at a state level or a city level or a school level or any specific employer's level. This is about the U.S. federal government, which has never tried to do anything like this and whether or not they should be allowed to specifically outside of a congressional action and through agency action in and of itself. Not only must the federal government properly invoke a constitutionally enumerated source of authority, says Gorsuch, to regulate in this area or any other, it must also act consistently with the Constitution's separate separation of powers. And when it comes to that obligation, this court has established at least one firm rule. We expect Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an executive agency decisions of vast economic and political significance. We sometimes call this the major questions doctrine. And that major questions doctrine is exactly as we discussed it earlier when reading this opinion. But Gorsuch explains its importance better than I can. He says, Congress has nowhere clearly assigned so much power to OSHA. What is OSHA's reply? It directs us to 29 U.S.C. 655. And in that statutory subsection, which is what the dissent is going to use, Congress authorized OSHA to issue emergency regulations upon determining that employees are exposed to grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful, and that such emergency standards are necessary to protect employees from such danger. The court rightly applies the major questions doctrine and concludes that this lone statutory subsection does not clearly authorize OSHA's mandate in this case, the vaccine mandate. Section 655 was not adopted in response to the pandemic, but some 50 years ago at the time of OSHA's creation. Since then, OSHA has relied on it to issue only comparatively modest rules addressing dangers uniquely prevalent inside the workplace like asbestos and rare chemicals. As the agency itself explained to a federal court less than two years ago, the statute does not authorize OSHA to issue sweeping health standards that affect workers' lives outside the workplace. We have nothing like that here. Why does the major questions doctrine matter? It ensures that the national government's power to make the laws that govern us remains where Article I of the Constitution says it belongs, with the people elected representatives. If administrative agencies seek to regulate the daily lives and liberties of millions of Americans, the doctrine says they must at least be able to trace that power to a clear grant of authority from Congress. In this respect, the major questions doctrine is closely related to what is sometimes called the non-delegation doctrine. The non-delegation doctrine ensures democratic accountability by preventing Congress from intentionally delegating its legislative powers to unelected officials. Sometimes lawmakers may be tempted to delegate power to agencies to reduce the degree to which they will be held accountable for unpopular actions. And this is one of those sometimes conspiracy theory, sometimes not, that you will see on blog posts and social media entries and all across the internet, which is Congress kicked this can over to an agency, to the executive branch, and Congress here can be the Republicans. Congress here can be the Democrats. Congress doesn't like to necessarily deal with controversial things, so they give a broad sweeping grant of authority to Agency X, and then Agency X can take the heat for COPPA or FTC regulations or antitrust rules or whatever else it might be that Congress has otherwise kicked away from itself. But the constitutional order says that can be okay for some things, but Congress can't just get, make an agency at the executive branch level into a separate super Congress because that is killing the constitutional structure that the founders and the country is based upon. 
or as Gorsuch says here, if Congress could hand off all its legislative powers to unelected agency officials, it would dash the whole scheme of our constitution and enable intrusions into the private lives and freedoms of Americans by bare edict rather than only with the consent of their elected representatives. The major questions doctrine serves a similar function by guarding against unintentional, oblique, or otherwise unlikely delegations of the legislative power. Sometimes Congress passes broadly worded statutes seeking to resolve important policy questions in a field while leaving an agency to work out the details of implementation. Later, the agency may seek to exploit some gap, ambiguity, or doubtful expression in Congress's statutes to assume responsibilities far beyond its initial assignment. The major questions doctrine guards against this possibility by recognizing that Congress does not usually hide elephants in mouse holes. So here we have the judiciary claiming a specific doctrine designed to protect the constitutional order by saying, hey, if Congress wants to send some really important powers to the executive, they got to be clear in saying that they are doing so. In this particular case, the court has found that Congress, 50 years ago particularly, didn't intend for OSHA to have the right to mandate vaccinations. On the one hand, OSHA claims the power to issue a nationwide mandate on a major question, but cannot trace its authority to do so to any clear congressional mandate, says Gorsuch. But on the other hand, if the statutory subsection the agency cites really did endow OSHA with the power it asserts, that law would likely constitute an unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority. And this is one of the only places you see this kind of reference. This only has Alito and Thomas and Gorsuch behind it. But it is an important concept that unlike some of the other stuff that the court says in both of these documents, Gorsuch and Thomas and Alito here are saying that even if Congress had given the authority to OSHA in this respect, it wouldn't have been constitutional because Congress can't imbue the executive branch with such sweeping and otherwise unregulated powers. Or as Gorsuch says, OSHA, if it had this power, would become little more than a roving commission to inquire into evils and upon discovery, correct them. If this court were to abide by these rules only in more tranquil conditions, declarations of emergencies would never end and the liberties our constitution separation of power seek to preserve would amount to little. So this is the only kind of deep dive into the major question doctrine that we get from the court on this. Remembering that the nine page opinion really doesn't talk about the specifics other than to say that OSHA wasn't given the authority, which leads us to the dissent. The dissent does what you would expect them to do. They point to that specific statute we talked about in the opinion and say, hey, look, this is an agent. This is a toxic. This is causing a grave danger. This is somebody at OSHA that says, hey, it is necessary to have this standard put in place. And more specifically, the court is jumping in to say that this shouldn't be allowed in a way that is putting the court's judgment in front of what the dissent argues is the congressional judgment. The statute, says the dissent, does not require that employees are exposed to those dangers only while on the workplace clock, and that should settle the matter. When Congress enacts expansive language offering no indication whatever that the statute limits what an agency can do, the court cannot impose limits on an agency's discretion that are not supported by the text. That is what the majority today does, impose a limit found no place in the governing statute. This is effectively an argument that this is not a major question, that the court isn't even within the doctrinal ballpark as to where the court should step in and argue this point. The dissent continues and continues and continues, finishing off with, if OSHA's standard is far-reaching, applying to many millions of American workers, it no more than reflects the scope of the crisis, that COVID-19, the pandemic in and of itself, is so unusual that Congress anticipated it 50 years ago and that somebody needs to be able to act. The standard, the rule, responds to a workplace health emergency unprecedented in the agency's history, an infectious disease that has already killed hundreds of thousands and sickened millions, that is most easily transmitted in the shared indoor spaces that are the hallmark of American working life, and that spreads mostly without regard to differences in occupation or industry. Over the past two years, COVID-19 has affected, indeed transformed, virtually every workforce and workplace in the nation. Employers and employees alike have recognized and responded to the special risks of transmission in work environments. And here you get a couple of overreaches, I think, from the dissent, one of which is the, the last part here, which is to say there's no question COVID-19 and the pandemic has transformed certain aspects of American and global life, 
a lot of that is driven by various institutions, municipalities, states, localities, or otherwise mandating certain things, prohibiting other things. And whether or not that is in effect, the question of the employers and employees alike is perhaps not as fully accurate as it might otherwise be. The other thing that's happening here from the dissent is, of course, talking about the scope of the crisis and reasonable minds can differ as to whether a lot of this is warranted, unwarranted. And nowhere in both of these documents will you actually see a discussion of the efficacy of the vaccines themselves, the transmissibility factor, whether or not the vaccines are changing that. You won't see reference to Omicron. The law moves slowly. So most of this is talking about Delta decision making either in September or November from the president or OSHA itself. And so you do get this kind of question of two different sides effectively arguing the efficacy of these things. Now, you do get a response in part from the dissent to Gorsuch, says underlying everything else in this dispute is a single simple question. Who decides how much protection and of what kind American workers need from COVID-19? An agency with expertise in workplace workplace health and safety acting as Congress and the president authorized or a court lacking any knowledge of how to safeguard workplaces and insulated from responsibility for any damage it causes. Obviously, the dissent feels one specific way about the OSHA mandate, but this is an interesting framing of the question separate, although identical in scope, as what Gorsuch put forth, where the answer to the question might be something different for each one of us. Certainly, the constitutional order has certain questions about Congress and the president and authorization and executive branch stuff that the court's opinion brings up. But some folks might actually answer this and say, who decides how much protection American workers need and point to either the individual or the states, which, of course, is where the Ninth and Tenth Amendment of the Constitution points the federal government in the first place. That isn't to put my thumb on either side of the scale here. I think both the dissent and the court itself make strong points for what they feel about this mandate, even if I don't feel that they make very strong points about how the law should be applied. And that leaves people looking at this and looking at the judiciary, I think, as a primarily political body, a fact that is made worse when one starts to read through the other decision released at the very same time, which... I think it's about time for us to do. So this is Joseph Biden versus the uh, versus Missouri and the Health and Human Services versus Louisiana. Per curiam opinion again, where you can later count up the dissents and concurrences and realize that this is 5-4 with effectively Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Roberts flipping sides from the OSHA decision to side with the dissent in this particular case. And while that's not unusual to have flips in various things, especially even on similar substance between these two opinions, it is unusual in the fact that they don't write this opinion to distinguish their thought process in the OSHA opinion basically at all. To find out what I mean, let's talk about what the document actually says. The Secretary of Health and Human Services administers the Medicare and Medicaid programs, which provide health insurance for millions of elderly, disabled, and low-income Americans. In November 2021, The secretary announced that in order to receive Medicare and Medicaid funding, participating facilities must ensure that their staff, unless exempt from medical or religious regions, are vaccinated against COVID-19. Now, from the very first paragraph here, I looked at this and said, okay, there's an obvious way to distinguish this particular case from the OSHA case. OSHA is a regulatory body. It imposes rules from on high as to how you operate your employer in the United States This is something different, and you can spot it right at the front. This is about funding. This is about the federal government actually providing money to specific facilities through Medicare and Medicaid and putting rules around that funding. And I looked at this and said, okay, I can see how they'll distinguish this. I can understand what the court's going to do. The court didn't do that. The Medicare program provides health insurance to individuals 65 and older. The Medicaid program does the same for those with low incomes. Both Medicare and Medicaid are administered by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who has general statutory authority to promulgate regulations, quote, as may be necessary to the efficient administration of the functions with which he is charged. To that end, Congress authorized the secretary to promulgate as a condition of a facility's participation in such programs to get the money from the feds, such requirements as he finds necessary in the interest of the health and safety of individuals who are furnished services to 
in the institution. Relying on these authorities, the secretary has established long lists of detailed conditions with which facilities must comply to be eligible to receive Medicare and Medicaid funds. Such conditions have long included a requirement that certain providers maintain and enforce an infection prevention and control program designed to help prevent the development and transmission of communicable diseases and infections. So before we go further here in this particular opinion, there's a couple of important things to know. One is the court here is going to side with the Secretary of Health and Human Services. You already got those signals here. We already knew that from the tweet that we looked at at the top of this video. But you can see that they're starting to put together some statutory authority. They've got USC 1302, 1395. They pull from regulations, 4380, some other CFR. Those are codes of federal regulations that are promulgated, fun legal term, under the statutes themselves. And they're putting together these various quotes, infection prevention and control programs. They talk about administration of the programs themselves. And this is an area where the dissent in this particular opinion will argue that they're pulling all these random statutes that don't go together, that are from definitions and from other things that don't relate to a vaccine mandate, because that's not a part of any of this stuff. And they're using it in a fashion that becomes a major question, which remember was the crux of how the OSHA decision was determined. Continuing, this opinion says on November 5th, 2021, the secretary issued an interim final rule amending the existing conditions of participation in Medicare and Medicaid to add a new requirement that facilities ensure that their covered staff are vaccinated against COVID-19. A facility's failure to comply may lead to monetary penalties, denial of payment for new admissions, and ultimately termination of participation in the programs. And if you're a healthcare provider in the United States, chances are you take Medicare and Medicaid money, and that's an important part of the way your budget operates. So this is a very significant threat from the U.S. federal government. Now, it is money that the federal government is paying, and if you're a healthcare provider and you're accepting that money, you've taken on the risk of certain strings being attached to that funding. More on that a little bit later. The secretary issued the rule after finding that vaccination of healthcare workers against COVID-19 was, quote unquote, necessary for the health and safety of individuals to whom care and services are furnished. That vaccinating the employees of these healthcare providers was necessary to ensure that the patients at the healthcare providers were properly protected, which raises a whole host of questions as to how the vaccines actually operate and what effect it has with Delta and Omicron and everything else. All of that is skipped because the court's a very poor party to actually determine these things, but is important to those of us on the outside that are thinking through how these rulings actually affect and how they might affect the way these agencies operate in the future. That determination was based on data showing that the COVID-19 virus can spread rapidly among healthcare workers and from them to patients, and that such spread is more likely when healthcare workers are unvaccinated. The secretary issued the rule as an interim final rule, again, an emergency kind of concept, rather than through the typical notice and comment procedures after finding, quote unquote, good cause that it should be made effective immediately. And the dissent's going to object massively to this part of the question. Again, even outside of the major questions doctrine or the non-delegation doctrine, one of the normal ways that an agency in the executive branch actually puts forth rules is that they offer them up to the public, the public is allowed to comment, and then they have to essentially respond to what those comments are and whether or not they're going to change the rules. We saw this writ large here in virtual legality with respect to COPPA and YouTube and how the FTC was dealing with those rules. We've seen it in other places, such as the Copyright Office and other various bodies promoting different ways to read given statutes and how they might otherwise interpret things from a regulatory basis. And now we see it here, except we don't see that comment process because both of these decisions were made on a quote unquote emergency basis. Shortly after the interim rules announcement, two groups of states, one led by Louisiana and one by Missouri, filed separate actions challenging the rule. The U.S. District Courts for the Western District of Louisiana and the Eastern District of Missouri each found the rule defective. Here, the court disagrees and will uphold the rule. First, we agree with the government that the secretary's rule falls within the authorities that Congress has conferred upon him. Now, one thing to note here is that this is a different statute. So whatever we talked about with respect to OSHA could be applied differently if, for instance, in this particular statute, there was a sentence that said, you shall have the right to authorize vaccines in a pandemic scenario or otherwise. That doesn't happen here. So we wind up with the same kind of arguments back and forth between the two sides of the court. But it is important to note, benefit of the doubt, if you want to read these things as somehow consistent, which I don't, but you could, you could look at it and say, hey, the statutes are different. They found things in the statutory language over here that they didn't find in the OSHA Act. And so the court is acting 
outside of politics and just reading the statute as put forth before it. I disagree, but one could do that. Continuing with the court's opinion, Congress has authorized the secretary to impose conditions on the receipt of Medicaid and Medicare funds that the secretary finds necessary in the interest of the health and safety of individuals who are furnished services. And then they point to this particular rule, 1395, and then you get an interesting unnumbered footnote. While this provision pertains only to hospitals, the secretary has similar statutory powers unreferenced with respect to most other categories of healthcare facilities covered by the interim rule. The dissent here talking about Justice Thomas points out that for five such kinds of facilities, the relevant statute does not contain any health and safety language, but employees at these facilities, which include end-stage renal disease clinics and home infusion therapy suppliers, represent less than 3% of the workers covered by the rule. This is an odd kind of footnote for the actual Supreme Court to take when engaged in statutory interpretation. I didn't go through all of these rules. I certainly didn't read through every kind of facility definition here, but allowing for the fact, as the opinion of the court seems to, that Justice Thomas is right, that this particular reference doesn't apply to anything but hospitals. And then the court says, well, mostly the language is similar in other places. Oh, and by the way, where it doesn't appear at all, that's only 3% of the people that this is trying to be applied to, is a very kind of weak set of arguments from the actual court in defending itself here. You get the impression that they feel that the decision is right. You get that same kind of political press that you got from the first opinion in the opposite direction, not responding to what would appear, even in this footnote, as written by the court itself, is a legitimate complaint about how the statute is being interpreted. It's, it's interesting. It doesn't really change much of anything here, but you don't really, in my opinion, want the Supreme Court to be saying, yeah, 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 maybe it doesn't apply to everybody, but that's only 3%. Still a significant amount of people, and those 3% of people that are affected are still going to be not happy if the court is forcing them to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. The Secretary of Health and Human Services determined that a COVID-19 vaccine mandate will substantially reduce the likelihood that healthcare workers will contract the virus and transmit it to their patients. The rule thus fits neatly within the language of the statute. Now, the court acknowledges the states and Justice Thomas offer a narrower view of the various authorities at issue, contending that the seemingly broad language cited above authorizes the secretary to impose no more than a list of bureaucratic rules regarding the technical administration of Medicare and Medicaid. But the longstanding practice of health and human services in implementing the relevant statutory authorities tells a different story. And here we, again, we get a court that appears to be skipping the statutory reading, right? And and that's not to impugn their good name on this kind of thing, but it's the same kind of approach we saw in the OSHA decision, which says, okay, so the statute might not say everything we wanted to say, but the longstanding practice of how the agency has implemented them tells a different story. In a perfect world, the longstanding practice of an agency that's doing something wrong for 50 years, and I'm not saying Health and Human Services is, but if they were, if they were doing something wrong for 50 years, the court should ostensibly come in and say, it doesn't matter that you've been doing it for a long time. If it's wrong, it's wrong. The court on this side of the spectrum, this part of the opinion, not the OSHA part, says, eh, longstanding practice pr protects them. As noted above, healthcare facilities that wish to participate in Medicare and Medicaid have always been obligated to satisfy a host of conditions that address the safe and effective provision of health care, not simply sound accounting. Such requirements govern in detail, for instance, the amount of time after admission or surgery within which a hospital patient must be examined and by whom. And most pertinent here, the programs that hospitals must implement to govern the surveillance, prevention, and control of infectious diseases. Moreover, says the court, the secretary routinely imposes conditions of participation that relate to the qualifications and duties of healthcare workers themselves. And the secretary has always justified these sorts of requirements by citing his authorities to protect patient health and safety. Of course, the court acknowledges the vaccine mandate goes further than what the secretary has done in the past to implement infection control, but he has never had to address an infection problem of this scale and scope before. So the court here acknowledges what was actually the crux of why OSHA lost their decision, which is that this has never been done before. Here, the court looks at the issue, says, well, we've got longstanding practice, though it doesn't really matter what the specifics of the statute says, before acknowledging that, while that might be longstanding practice, they've never done this before, but they've never had to. And so you get this real 
stretched, attenuated legal argument that says we're going to side with them and it doesn't really matter what anything else says. And you could certainly read the OSHA opinion in the same way to the opposite effect. So I'm not trying to let the Supreme Court off the hook on either side of the equation here. His response is not a surprising one. Vaccination requirements are a common feature of the provision of healthcare in America. Healthcare workers around the country are ordinarily required to be vaccinated for diseases such as hepatitis B, influenza, and measles, mumps, and rubella. As the secretary explained, these pre-existing state requirements are a major reason the agency has not previously adopted vaccine mandates as a condition of participation. So here the court's explaining why we haven't seen this before at a federal level, but kind of skipping the constitutional question, which is, well, we've always said these mandates are allowed at the state level. Certainly the Supreme Court has said it for centuries at this point in time. So the state adopting those vaccines isn't really controversial. Here, using that as an explanation for why the federal government hasn't actually enacted those vaccines, I find to be a little hollow. We know states can do this. States, in fact, are mandating vaccines in various places. And that seems to be the normal course of business for the Constitution of the United States, that this is something else doesn't actually get you out of the argument that the federal government isn't authorized to have this power. They're just pointing out they haven't done it before because it was already covered by the states. Really poses the question why it couldn't be covered by the states in this instance as well. All this is perhaps why healthcare workers and public health organizations overwhelmingly support the secretary's rule. And this is kind of a non sequitur. It's kind of off the beaten path for what the court should be discussing here, but it's also at least somewhat partially related to that question about the equities, whether the public interest favors something, how the people feel about these specific requirements. So I'll allow the court that, even though it's kind of out of nowhere when discussing this various potpourri of why it's okay, they're deciding what they're deciding. We accordingly conclude that the secretary did not exceed his statutory authority in requiring that in order to remain eligible for Medicare and Medicaid dollars, the facilities covered by the interim rule must ensure that their employees be vaccinated against COVID-19. And here we're going to take a step back. We're going to see some other arguments from the court trying to disarm the dissent's arguments against it. But I wanted to point out here how I thought this would be distinguished. You get references to Medicare and Medicaid dollars. And the reason you get those references is because there's a fairly simple way to distinguish this part of the case from the OSHA case, and that is all related to the funding power of the U.S. Congress. So here I'm going to talk about a case called South Dakota versus Dole. And if you aren't familiar with this, we're not going to go over the specifics so much. You can see it's from 1987. Basically, this was a challenge to the ability of the federal government to withhold dollars from states until they enacted a 21-year-old drinking law. And here the court allows that. And they say a couple of things. They say, one, the Constitution empowers Congress to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, which the courts have read before Dole and now in Dole as the power of Congress to authorize expenditures of public monies for public purposes is not limited by the direct grants of legislative power found in the Constitution. Now, You can agree or disagree with that concept. It is, in fact, Supreme Court precedent that regardless of what I just told you about the constitutional structure, about how the federal government and Congress is to be limited specifically by the powers given to it in the Constitution itself, the Supreme Court has held that the spending power for the general welfare basically acts as a kind of superpower that Congress has to effectively coerce the state's and other bodies to do what Congress wants, even if Congress couldn't otherwise do it, by essentially holding the bag and saying, well, you can get this money if you do X, Y, or Z. If you make that drinking law 21 years old, you get this highway funds. But if you don't, you don't get the highway funds. Someone complains and says, Congress doesn't have the authority to enact a drinking law. That's not what the Constitution allows Congress to do. They say, yeah, that's fine, but it does allow us to choose who to spend on. And so the courts have said, the exercise of the spending power can allow Congress to do things that it can't otherwise do with a couple of rules. One, the exercise of the spending power must be in pursuit of the general welfare. I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that the decisions about healthcare workers aren't intended for the general welfare. Certainly folks of reasonable minds can argue whether they actually do that or not, but they're intended to enhance the general welfare. Second, We have required that if Congress desires to condition the state's receipt of federal funds, it must do so unambiguously, enabling the states to exercise their choice knowingly, 
cognizant of the consequences of their participation, which you might think, hey, we're back in major questions land. We're deciding whether or not Congress has actually given the authority to issue vaccines. I don't read it quite the same way. Here, the question of whether states should have been working with the congressional purview here is whether or not they should be taking Medicare or Medicaid dollars at all, right? That this is a funding question of whether or not they should get that money. And if they participate in that program, then they've understood that strings can be attached of virtually any kind, as long as they support the general welfare. And third, our cases have suggested without significant elaboration that conditions on federal grants might be illegitimate if they are unrelated to the federal interest in particular national projects or programs. Here, under Dole, you've got a concept that says, hey, you're taking Medicare money. We've got the ability to condition that on basically anything that we want, as long as it's in the advancement of Medicare and the general welfare. We're doing just that here. And so I figured what would happen in these two cases would be that you'd get a distinguishing analysis of these statutes because they are funding statutes and not just regulatory statutes. And you get references to that fact here. But instead of actually going down that road and providing two sets of opinions that make sense and can be read together, you instead get all of this politicizing from both sets of opinions. And you get what amounts to a large gray area as to whether or not there's a major question purported here at all. Because I will tell you right now, the statutes that the court points to to defend its decision over here are not much clearer than what is in the OSHA opinion. And the OSHA statutes aren't less clear than what the court decides its opinion on here with respect to the healthcare workers, which leads you to, as a lawyer, I don't know what the hell they're doing. And in fact, I do know what in the hell they're doing. They're making the decision as people have accused them of based on what they want the outcome to be and then kind of backfilling what the decision should be. And that's a bad way to operate a judiciary. But you've heard me talk about the Roberts Court before. Now let's talk about the opinion here, trying to disarm some of the dissent arguments. You see, first, the interim rule is not arbitrary and capricious. They're fighting against the emergency concept. Given the rulemaking record, which we don't otherwise see uh, elaborated on in this document, it cannot be maintained that the secretary failed to examine the relevant data and articulate a satisfactory explanation for his decisions to, one, impose the vaccine mandate instead of a testing mandate, which again is different from what OSHA tried to do, two, require vaccination of employees with natural immunity from prior COVID-19 illness. So you're still required to be vaccinated even if you've gotten COVID before and otherwise have antibodies. And three, depart from the agency's prior approach of merely encouraging vaccination. So the argument that was made here is, hey, you're doing things differently than you've ever done, which the court acknowledges. You didn't properly give us information about why this is imposed in this specific way and doesn't give exemptions for things like natural immunity. And the court just says, nah, it's not arbitrary and capricious. It's an emergency. The secretary is finding that accelerated promulgation of the rule in advance of the winter flu season would significantly reduce COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and deaths constitutes the something specific required to forego notice and comment. And we cannot say that in this instance, the two months the agency took to prepare a 73-page rule constitutes delay inconsistent with the secretary's finding of good cause. That's the other aspect of this that I think rubbed a number of people the wrong way. You get a September speech from President Biden, then you get a November rule, then you get delays in even the implementation of that November rule, and you have a question of, okay, if this is such an emergency, why is it imposed 10 months after the vaccines come out? Why is it imposed two months after the president says it's an emergency? Why does that rule that is promulgated two months after that point in time not take an effect for another month, month and a half, two months? And the court says, well, it's still an emergency and we're not going to second guess the secretary. Okay. We similarly concur with the secretary that he need not prepare a regulatory impact analysis discussing a rule's effect on small rural hospitals when he acts through an interim final rule. That requirement applies only where the secretary proceeds on the basis of a notice of proposed rulemaking followed by a final version of the rule, which is an interesting bare minimum loophole in the way that this statute is structured. Here, the court is actually saying, you don't need to do the same kind of impact analysis and talk to the people that are actually affected by this rule if you go through this emergency basis. That's a strong incentive to actually use that emergency basis, I would argue. Lastly, the rule does not run afoul of the directive in section 1395 that federal officials may not exercise any supervision or control over the manner in which medical services are provided or over the selection or tenure of any officer or employee of any facility. That reading of section 1395 would mean that nearly every condition of participation the secretary has long insisted upon 
is unlawful. And it would, seemingly. The quote here is that apparently this section says you can't exercise supervision or control over the manner in which medical services are provided, which makes sense from a constitutional structure perspective. You're creating a Medicare and Medicaid funding portal. You're not trying to run every specific hospital. But here, again, I find the court's argument against this relatively hollow, where they say, well, if if that statute were to be enforced the way it sounds then everything that the secretary has done would be unlawful. And that's not an answer to an actual legal analysis. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You have to actually tell you the statute why it doesn't apply in the manner that it is being argued, not just that, hey, if we read it that way, that would mean all of this stuff is wrong. It might. The challenges posed by a global pandemic do not allow a federal agency to exercise power that Congress has not conferred upon it. Both of those opinions agree on that. At the same time, Such unprecedented circumstances provide no grounds for limiting the exercise of authorities the agency has long been recognized to have. Again, alighting kind of the concept of, hey, no, they've never actually asked for a vaccine of this type ever, Uh, but they have done other things that the court finds useful to this analysis. Because the latter principle governs in these cases, the applications for a stay presented to Justice Alito and Justice Kavanaugh and by them referred to the court are granted. And then we get some more of the legalese. So, as I said, you've got two opinions, both seemingly governed by very inchoate legal argumentation about major questions that apply or don't apply with a flip of Kavanaugh and Roberts in a direction that doesn't make a ton of sense for them to also be signatory to the per curiam opinion on the OSHA side. And now you have Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Barrett as four people dissenting. So this side of the equation is 5-4, the other side is 6-3, and this dissent does what you would expect it to do. Because there is no real dispute that this case merits our review, our decision turns primarily on whether the government can make a strong showing that it is likely to succeed in the, on the merits. In my view, the government has not made such a showing here. And Thomas goes forth and analyzes all these statutes. And I'm not going to waste your time, except to point out that they are from various different places. They are pieced together with references to health and safety. And Thomas finds that to be dispositive of that major questions concept that says, if you aren't clear, you don't get the power, which he articulates again here. We expect Congress to speak clearly when authorizing an agency to exercise powers of vast economic and political significance. And we expect Congress to use exceedingly clear language if it wishes to significantly alter the balance between state and federal power. The omnibus rule is undoubtedly significant. It requires millions of healthcare workers to choose between losing their livelihoods and acquiescing to a vaccine they have rejected for months. Vaccine mandates also fall squarely within a state's police power. That's long been the opinion of the Supreme Court. In fact, every time you were on Twitter or social media and heard reference to Zuck or Jacobson or anything else, it was always to discuss the ability of the states to exercise that power, which, when reserved to the states, is not generally the federal government's power. Here, the court says, until now, only rarely has such vaccines been a tool of the federal government. If Congress had wanted to grant CMS authority to impose a nationwide vaccine mandate and consequently alter the state federal balance, it would have said so clearly, and it did not. These cases are not about the efficacy or importance of COVID-19 vaccines. They are only about whether CMS has the statutory authority to force healthcare workers by coercing their employers to undergo a medical procedure they do not want and cannot undo because the government has not made a strong showing that Congress gave CMS that authority. I would deny this day's pending appeal, and I respectfully dissent. So it's a major question, says Thomas and the four other justices that also said the OSHA was a major question. The only flips are Kavanaugh and Roberts who don't explain thoroughly why this isn't a major question. You then get a second dissent. Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, and Barrett, same four, saying effectively, under our constitution, the authority to make laws that impose obligations on the American people is conferred on Congress whose members are elected by the people. That sentence alone should key you in on the fact that we are once again going to be talking about constitutional order, just as the concurrence did in the OSHA case, a concurrence notably that did not include Kavanaugh, Barrett, or Roberts. Elected representatives solicit the views of their constituents, listen to their complaints and requests, and make a great effort to accommodate their concerns. Today, however, most federal law is not made by Congress. It comes in the form of rules issued by unelected administrators. In order to give individuals and entities who may be seriously impacted by agency rules at least some opportunity to make their views heard and to have them given serious consideration, 
Congress has clearly required that agencies comply with basic procedural safeguards. This is that notice and comment argument. Because of the importance of notice and comment rulemaking, an agency must show good cause if it wishes to skip that process. The agency that issued the mandated issue here admits it did not comply with the common sense measure of seeking public input before placing binding rules on millions of people, but claims instead that the data showing the vital importance of vaccination indicates that it cannot delay in taking this action. Although CMS argues that an emergency justifies swift action, both district courts below held that CMS fatally undercut that justification with its own repeated delays. And we talked about that as well. So here is the end state, right? I wrote this thumbnail. I wrote this video, how to not write opinions, because I felt it was supremely important for folks in the United States to understand what the Supreme Court did here and what it didn't do. In the OSHA case, it finds that there are major questions. And because of those major questions that Congress did not delegate the authority that OSHA is claiming that OSHA can't do what it said it was going to do. Here, the court finds the opposite, that CMS Health and Human Services does have the authority, even though the structure of these two statutory analyses wind up being effectively the same. And longstanding practices of one and the other and a lack of vaccination for both wind up in two different sets of opinions when it was so easy to distinguish these two cases based on the fact that one is a funding federal program and one is not. So at the end of the day, I hope you found this enlightening. Unfortunately, it's not terribly useful for long-term analysis of what the Supreme Court might do on any given case in the pandemic, in the vaccine mandate question, except to say that Roberts and Kavanaugh in particular seem to be driven by what they feel is appropriate action as they, in their unelected judicial determination, might otherwise decide for OSHA, for CMS, for you, for me, and for President Biden. So we're stuck with Roberts and Kavanaugh and the court system that I think is justified in being as pilloried as it is by journalists of all political persuasions and all stripes. And we'll just have to wait and see exactly where it goes from here. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoy talking about important legal issues, mostly in the world of pop culture, software, technology, and more, please consider supporting the channel at Patreon. Otherwise, we've got other ways to support the channel listed below. If that doesn't make sense to you, can't blame you for that. Just subscribing, telling your friends, upvoting, downvoting, doing the rest, sharing these videos around every little bit helps. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.